uh, in uh, cold atom, which uh, might have uh, far-reaching consequences. Uh, this concept uh, probably is, uh, uh, in my looks to you, a little bit, uh, say, complex at the very beginning. But you have to think that also shaking on ice is uh, something complex. But once you learn, you can speed it up uh, quite, uh, quite uh, uh, far. So uh, this uh, new idea might bring a new pers uh, perspective on, uh, on the field and might provide a new method uh, of uh, uh, computing uh, non-perturbative quantities. So this is a crash course of uh, three lectures on various aspects and method of integrability, in particular in the field of uh, cold atoms. So uh, the first lecture, which will be today, is uh, the main message is the following. Lieblinger is essentially the only integrable model in, uh, in town for doing uh, cold atoms. And uh, the way of proving is uh, quite interesting. So I will uh, uh, bring you in a stroll on uh, concept of integrability, what it is about. Uh, and then we will take a point of view which uh, is the following, that uh, if you enlarge from the very beginning the perspective uh, alias, you start studying uh, uh, non relat uh, sorry, you start studying quantum field theory alias a relativistic model, which uh, apparently has nothing to do with uh, the realm of uh, cold atom, which is not relativistic. However, if you enlarge this perspective and you come uh, somehow from above, you will see that uh, all uh, uh, models that we are uh, used to, to study can be seen as a non-relativistic limit. And this provides a lot of constraint on what the model can be. And uh, therefore, I will uh, show you that uh, in this way, you are able to pin down that Lieblinger and Young Godin models, which are generalization thereof, is uh, indeed the only model in town for uh, uh, cold atom for doing uh, uh, cold atom physics. So this is today. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to discuss, once we select out the Lieblinger is the model that we have to concern with, tomorrow we are going to dedicate the entire lecture to discuss the exact solution of the Lieblinger model. In particular, how to, select, I mean, how to spell out ground state properties how to uh, make uh, use of the better answer solution, which provide indeed the, the, uh, uh, the property of the, of the model. And then we'll discuss also thermodynamic alias when we have a finite temperature and density of the particle. Now this uh, uh, approach, as we'll uh, discuss tomorrow, uh, bring a lot of knowledge on the property of this model. However, leave out an entire uh, sector of it, which is how to compute correlation function, which is not easy, not impossible, but definitely quite uh, difficult to do in the scheme of better answers uh, concept and methodology. So from this point of view, we will see that taking the point of view of relativistic model provide uh, indeed uh, quite uh, remarkable uh, result because uh, give you the exact solution for the correlation function. And this because uh, relativistic model, like Sinch Gordon in this case, has all the equation that allow you to pin down the correlation function. Because uh, the model is much more constrained, and therefore once you have done uh, this model and in, in the this calculation, the context of Sinch Gordon model, become relatively easy to take a limit. So once you have a solution, you are able to take the limit, and then uh, you get uh, for free a quantity which uh, refer to the Lieblinger, although would have been quite difficult to, to recover from the very beginning, because uh, you do not have enough equation to, to do it. And so uh, this will bring us uh, in the discussion of various quantities, like the form factor of the model, and also a special formula that I worked it out with Leclerc some times ago for handling finite temperature and finite density. Okay? So this is essentially the, the roadmap. So today we will uh, arrive to the conclusion that Lieblinger is the only model of our concern. 
Tomorrow we will solve it, and then I will tell you in the third lecture how to make use of this technology of quantum field theory to pin down quantities which refer to the lib linear model. Okay, uh, please interrupt me if there is uh, any question during the lecture. I will be very, very glad to, to address them. So, no relativistic limit of integrable quantum field theory and lib linear model. So, uh, this is based on a series of uh, papers that uh, I started years ago with Andrea Trombettoni, who is here, and Martin Kormos. But today, I'm going to discuss in uh, quite detail a paper that you will find on the net, uh, together with uh, Alvise Bastianello, Andrea De Luca, and myself, which is indeed uh, where we show uh, the thesis that I want to, to, to show you today that uh, of the ubiquitous, how to say, or lib linear model in, uh, uh, in uh, non-relativistic uh, integrable model. So everything starts from a very, very simple observation. The observation is, uh, if you know a little bit of literature of integrable model in the general context of uh, uh, field theory, there is a very, very striking fact but very striking. The striking fact is, uh, if you go and check relativistic integrable model, you will find a lot, many, many, many. So here are just a partial list. You will find Sinch Gordon, Sign Gordon, Bull of Dodd, Toda Field Theory, Gross Nivea, Sigma Model, Supersymmetry. I mean, an amazing uh, amount of, uh, of uh, models which respect the fact to be exactly solvable and to be integrable. However, when you compare this extraordinary richness with the extremely paucity of a non-relativistic model, you will find essentially that uh, the only model that you come across is the lib linear. So how come? I mean, wh wh what's going on here? Okay, so it's pretty, pretty striking contrast. Now, I have to do a disclaimer in order to put in perspective what I'm doing. The disclaimer is uh, that I'm interested in model which has Galilean invariance, so that I can translate it, and it's also described by a local Hamiltonian. Okay, Lieblinger is a such type. For instance, what I'm not going to talk, but not because it's not important, because it's not the way I can approach it, it requires a separate discussion, is, for instance, list of non-relativistic integrable models which are intrinsically defined on a lattice, okay? Like, for instance, XX, Z model, or alike. By the way, also these are interests for cold atom, because you can realize with optical lattice, you can do very extraordinary physics of it. But here I'm concerned in question of principle. I would like to understand under the general condition what I'm talking about. So this model, I insist, are extremely interesting. However, for my purposes, I can say this is lattice model. So you have to have a lattice, you have some quantity which are discrete, and this and that. As well as, I'm not going to talk about uh, model, extremely interesting once again, like Calogero, Shastri, Sutherland, and, non and so on and so forth, because uh, they are non-local, or if you want, not ultra-local. So they require interaction which spread on a certain distance. And this is uh, encoded in this potential here. As well as, I'm not going to talk about KDV equation, which is a very well-known integrable model, and why not? Because this model is intrinsically chiral. This model just goes in one direction. You cannot bring in the other direction. Move just in one direction. As well as, I'm not going to talk about model like Boussinesque, because this model has higher derivative. So it's of very higher order, okay? So essentially, what I'm interested in uh, is uh, if there is a way of constrain theory which are done the following. I have a bunch of fields here denoted by psi. It's not fermions, it's just fields. It can be also fermions, but not necessarily. 
And then there is a potential in which these fields interact uh, uh, together, which is a local, okay? made in terms of fields at the given position, not field here and field there. So this uh, admits an equation of motion, which essentially is this guy here. So put differently, I'm interested in constraining what kind of potential I can have, which uh, give uh, later an integrable dynamics for the model I'm concerned with. Clear? So for instance, in the context of field theory, here, provided the, the quadratic form is always the same, you can have really many, 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 many potential. Here, on the other hand, I want to conclude that there is only one. Okay? This is the, essentially the, the claim I'm going to do it. Okay, so all this bring us really to the question, can we really classify quantum integrable model? So the question I would like to, to say is in the same spirit uh, when you say, I want to classify state of matter. What are the possible elementary compound of matter? And we know there are only the element encoding this table cannot be anything else, is all and only. As well as when you say, what are the really the basic things of fundamental physics in elementary particles? This is it. You have quark, gluons, and this. And then using them, you can build up the rest of things. Now, in more mathematical uh, uh, setting, imagine that you want to classify what are all possible groups, finite groups. At the end, these are all and only uh, elements that you can have. Or when you put question about, what about Lie algebra? What are the group that can have and cannot have? Now, each time that you ask question about classification, you have to be very, very careful what are your hypotheses. So you know very well that also in group, if you don't put the constraint that the group are compact, uh, you might end up in another, in another setting. So you have to be very careful what are your hypotheses. And I stress again, my setting where I'm moving, I'm moving in local theory with local potential. So I, I want to uh, see if I'm able to pin down theory within this uh, hypothesis. So I take it out, as I said, lattice, non-local, uh, uh, non chiral, and this and that. Okay, so this is uh, the way I'm, uh, I'm moving. Now, this uh, poses immediately a very, very interesting uh, problem, that is uh, what we meant by quantum integrable model. Now, the story is very, very subtle, very, very subtle. And the story is very subtle because in quantum mechanics you have linearity, which might not conflict, but is not uh, the same that in uh, quantum, uh, in uh, classical mechanics, when you have also functional uh, relation between operators. Okay, so we have to define what we mean by quantum integrable models. Now, this question has as many answers as many people you ask. Because uh, depend on the sen sensibility, I have to say, depend on the, also the background of the people you ask to. For instance, you might try to extend naively what is the notion of integrability alla Liouville in classical mechanics. I remind you that in classical mechanics you have n degrees of freedom. You say it's completely integrable if you have n uh, integral of motion, independent. This is the point. In quantum mechanics, this independence is a little bit blurred because in uh, classical mechanics, independent means functional independence. If you have E, you don't want to have E square, for instance, okay? Now, in uh, quantum mechanics, this is a bit, uh, 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 you have to be a bit careful because if you take an Hamiltonian, just to say a very, very, simple example, imagine I have an Hamiltonian, 
And imagine I diagonalize this Hamiltonian brutally. You just give me an Hamiltonian, I just put a very powerful computer, click, I diagonalized, I have all the relative uh, eigenvalues, but then I have all the relative projectors. Now this projector uh, trivially commute with everything else and also with the Hamiltonian. So this means that any system of the world is integrable. Well, no, of course not. And this is also related to the fact that uh, you want to bring into the game locality. Because projector on uh, uh, energy uh, again space is not a local operator. Okay? So I just want to I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to enter in detail in all these subtleties, but just want to warn you that if you try to extend naively what is the notion of Liouville, maximum integrability in uh, classical mechanics directly in quantum mechanics, well, I mean, there is a lot to talk about it. Now, other people take the very pragmatic point of view that a system is quantum integrable if you know how to solve it. Full stop. Now, this means that uh, if you are able to tell me the set of eigenstates and, and energy, done. And this, for instance, is how better answers work, of course, based on integrability. But one might think that there exists other way of uh, solving and therefore declaring quantum uh, integrable a model, and therefore is very pragmatical point of view. Another uh, very pragmatical point of view is the following. Imagine that you are very smart with, say, numerics. So I give you a model, you are able to sort it out energy, levels, and this and that. And then you start doing statistics on this level. So imagine I give you an Hamiltonian, you have a very, very powerful computer. Once again, you brutally diagonalize. And then on this Hamiltonian, you know, you can do a lot of uh, uh, statistics very blindly say, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I can, I can study and I can see if I can recover some information on it. So for instance, when you give this Hamiltonian, you can compute what are called the gap. So you might compute difference between energy levels. Of course, this quantity is dimensionful so, depend on the scale you are using, if it's big, large, and so on and so forth. So, is, uh, is uh, really uh, nice to normalize to the average of uh, the, all the possible gap. At this point, you have a variable, let's call SI, which is really independent of any scale. And uh, if you come back to the same uh, energy spectrum in this new unit, essentially what you are talking about is uh, an harmonic oscillators, because now all the gap are uh, order one. And so what matter is really the fluctuation with respect to the harmonic oscillators. So are the gap larger than one, smaller than one? How many are larger than one? How many small? So in particular, you can make an histogram, how many gaps you have of uh, order S in your spectrum. And here is the point. This distribution can be, for instance, Poissonian, something like e to the minus S, or can be something which vanish at the origin. Now, given just this simple uh, information, you can conclude a lot about the system you are talking about. Because if uh, the distribution is Poissonian, this one, means there is a very high probability that two energy lines cross. Okay? Because the gap is zero. So imagine that ideally you have some parameters 
in which you are, you are plotting the energy. So in one case, you will have a lot of crossing, level crossing. Because level crossing means the probability of getting zero gap is high. Now, you probably know that when you have, uh, when, when you have the generators, the, the spectra are, are degenerate, of course, when you, they cross are degenerate. However, from, uh, if you have uh, two lines in the plane, the probability they cross is essentially one. So if you put the two lines in the plane, unless you make parallel, they cross. But if the line comes from an Hamiltonian, the probability they cross is not one. You should have condition that they cross. And the condition is that they should belong to two different blocks of the Hilbert space. Say differently, there might exist underline other operator under which you have diagonalized the Hamiltonian such that now you can split completely the Hilbert space. At this point, these two lines does not know anything about them, each to the other, and therefore the micros. Okay? So when uh, you get a Poissonian distribution, very probable your system is integrable, alias it has not only the Hamiltonian, but other uh, integral of motion under which uh, the spectrum is invariant. On the other hand, when they repel each other, means there exists none. Okay? So, this uh, essentially justifies this sentence, namely, you might think, of course, you have to put uh, further support that the system is quantum integrable. If you just make an energy level statistics, uh, you find this Poissonian. Okay? And finally, a system is quantum integrable if the scattering is support because we have a system in which there are excitations. This excitation moves and this excitation makes scattering. And you want to find out what are the properties of this uh, scattering. And you declare a system is quantum integrable if the spectrum is not diffractive. And this is the things I'm going to use in this lecture to pin down the possible integrable model, please. Yeah, uh, some, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I in this, uh, you can work it out, uh, for instance, uh, of course, if you have, uh, uh, if you have independent commuting quantum operator, eh, this, of course, imply this. You can, uh, because you can diagonalize the Hamiltonian together with infinite number of, uh, and therefore you are able to write it down functional equation for that. Uh, this, this vice versa, as far as I know, unless trivial example has never worked out a full-fledged model which is solvable, which at the end of the day is not integrable, unless it's a bit, uh, uh, I would say, artificial. For instance, the spherical model is a model which is uh, solvable, although it's strictly speaking is not uh, integrable. Okay? But then there the story is a long range. For instance, there is something related to the large end limit and so on and so forth. So a pure model which has all the, how to say, all the uh, properties that we expect, locality, number of degrees of freedom which are finite or scale in a certain way and so on, which is solvable and not integrable, it's, it's an open question. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I will. I will. I no, 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 sure, sure, you're right. No, no, but this is uh, precisely what I'm going to do. Uh, yeah, 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 sure, sure, absolutely. No, is uh, the word with, okay, I'm going to explain that. Don't worry, I'm, uh, I'm just doing it. Uh, in the meantime, let, let, give me just five minutes to, to, to the, non-diffractive essentially means that uh, you have elasticity. The model doesn't have any ripple which propagate, but I'm going to uh, use it in great detail. So give me five minutes to, to arrive to that. Now, let me pose also you the following question. Imagine that I give you a non-relativistic model, so an equation, okay? An equation of motion in which uh, you have the derivative of something given by some function of this. Now, uh, integrability means uh, that the system has, uh, on top of the Hamiltonian, other uh, densities which are conserved, okay? 
and this density are local. So integrability means So I have uh, an Hamiltonian which is given by some uh, density in X. Now, this Hamiltonian, of course, uh, if it doesn't depend on time, is zero. Now, integrability means that together with the Hamiltonian, I have infinite number of charges labeled by certain uh, label S, which I can always write in terms of some local density. And this local density, actually, uh, let me satisfy a. Uh, so Q is uh, just uh, the zero component of a charge. So I will have uh, conservation law of this type, which has to be supported together with the Hamiltonian, okay? Integrability means that you have uh, many, many, in particular infinite number of currents which are conserved, okay? Now, the fact is uh, that this quantity has to be local. So it means that if you give me an equation, you should be able to construct or not this quantity given the equation of motion. So the conservation law of this type should be a consequence of the equation of motion of your theory. Okay? So, if you give me phi to the fourth, and now Ginsburg, there is no way I can construct these charges compatible with the equation of motion. But if you give me the equation of motion sine Gordon, I'm able to construct for you infinite number of them. Okay? Now, I want to pose the following question. Imagine that I give you an Hamiltonian. There is no general procedure to know whether this uh, uh, equation of motion is supported or not by a conservation charges. Okay? There is no general procedure. So this, uh, so this is the equation of motion, the conservation law I'm talking about. So this poses uh, a very conceptual and logic problem, which I pose here in the form of Alting problem. Alting, you know, is the famous problem of Turing. Given an algorithm, do I know if I stop? The answer is no. Okay. So the fact is, imagine that for a given uh, motion, I try up to a certain level in derivative, because, because these uh, charges are labeled by derivative. Okay, so I have second derivative, third derivative, this provides me an ordering. Imagine that you try by brute force to find conservation law up to a certain level. But you didn't. Does this imply that it doesn't exist at the last level? No. So this means that you should go a priori forever to conclude if a model is integral or not integrable. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a serious problem. I'm posing you a conceptual and logic problem. If I give you an equation, how the hell are you are going to see if it's integrable or not? Problem, okay? Now, here it come the main uh, criteria I want to use it. So, the non-relativistic versus relativistic alias quantum field theory. There is a very, very striking difference. The striking difference is that in non-relativistic model, the number of particles is conserved. So if you start with uh, n particles, the further evolution will remain the same number. On the other hand, in quantum field theory, the number of particles is not conserved. Because if you provide uh, enough energy, you might produce new particles. It's what they do in CERN each day, okay? It's enough that you give me enough energy, it might happen that the number of particles is not conserved. Hence, it should be simpler to identify conceptually 
an integrable quantum field theory, then an integrable non relativistic one through the last criterion, alias the non diffractive scattering. So the thing is, I'm going to find condition in field theory such that order by order, I'm going to show, I kill the production process. So this for me is non diffractive scattering. Okay? So non diffractive means elastic. It's clear the point, it's really a conceptual point. The point is, if I remain in the realm of non relativistic model, I'm not to, I don't want to say that you cannot do it. People have acquired a lot of experience, so are able to tell you that K dev A is integrable, if you deform it is not, there is experience. But I'm just taking the point of view of a person just coming from Mars, know the basic uh, step of logic, and want to understand when something is integral or when it's not, or say differently, I want to extract a dull computer to give me a criteria, if I insert an input, to have an answer. Is it integral or not? And the dull computer should know something based on, not experience, but based on something that is able to control step by step. Okay. No product, indeed. I, and now I'm going to... So, integral versus non-integrable quantum field theory alias elastic versus diffractive. So, integrable means that no matter how much energy I give in the center of mass of a process, the final result will always be the same state. I forgot to say one thing which is crucial in the story. The thing is which is crucial in the story is why the existence of an infinite number of conservation law imply elasticity and vice versa. And the argument is very, very simple. The argument is uh, these uh, charges are labeled by these uh, parameters, and this parameter is essentially the order of the derivative. So what I want to say is this. These charges transform under the Lorentz group in as a tense order S. Okay? So this means that when they act on a state of a particle P, this charge has uh, eigenvalues which are essentially proportional to the momentum of this particle to the power S. Okay? So imagine that you have an infinite number of these conserved charges of uh, spin, how it's called S. This means that you have uh, an infinite number. So imagine that you give me a scattering which I have P par N particle in and N particle out of momentum P1, Pn, Q1, Qm. Now, if I have integrability, I have an infinite chain of conservation law which read the following. Pi, S, N has to be equal, like this, okay? So, for instance, if you have uh, the Hamiltonian, the momentum is something like P1, Pn has to be Q1, QM. So this expresses just the conservation of momenta. But if you give me a bunch of momenta, this can be distributed differently among the other M particles. But imagine I'm requiring that also the third power has to be conserved. Imagine that you require that also the fifth power has to be conserved. Imagine that you require an infinite number of powers to be conserved. The only solution analytic of this system is that the number of particles m has to be equal to the number of particles n of the in initial states, and the only thing that can happen is a permutation of them. Okay? So, an infinite number of conservation law imply necessarily that the scattering has to be elastic, has to be non-diffractive. Here, I'm trying to use the point of view vice versa. I'm trying to use, if I set up condition to have elasticity, 
which is very extraordinary condition in field theory, somehow I'm selecting out what are the interactions which are integrable. Okay? So elastic process means uh, that no matter how energy you give uh, here in the center of mass, you find the same, uh, the same uh, states as output. On the other hand, production process means that if you give me enough energy to produce particle, I produce it. Because by Einstein relation, everything which is energy can go in mass and vice versa. Okay, so why this point of view is useful? Because uh, field theory is uh, not only a very rich subject, but very, very, very constrained. For instance, you have to combine quantum mechanics with spatial relativity. And this has far off consequences, okay? So you have Poincaré invariance, you should have unitarity, crossing, which is very important, and locality. And in particular, for my purpose today, you might have all the formulation, which is diagrammar. I'm, I'll explain what, what it means, the diagrammar, in a minute. So, on the other hand, I want to draw your attention that the generic uh, parameters of any field theory, we have the Planck constant and the speed of light. Now, it's very stupid, simple observation, but very, very, very convenient. Because once you solve a field theory in full glory, you can take limit like h bar goes to zero, and this gives you the classical analogous, or you might take speed of light to infinity and give you the non-relativistic theory. And today I'm going to explore this limit here. So I'm going to explore the limit once I solve the theory, and of course you have to restore the velocity of light in which I send the velocity of light to infinity. However, it's not the only operation you have to do it, because uh, giving velocity of light to infinity, you are giving to the mass infinite gap, right? Because the mass is mc squared, essentially. So you have to do something else. So you have to tune the coupling constant. Now, in the example I'm going to show, the tuning uh, is realized sending g to zero. In other theory, it might be a different limit. The concept I want to say is that you cannot naively take C goes to infinity because the theory blows up. You have to tune something in order that the energy of the excitation is finite, alias there should be some double limit of this form. Okay? Clear? Okay, so what we are going to discuss now, I'm going to show you a very algorithmic way to extract a computer, a dull computer, to recognize integrable model. Then I'm going to show you how to take the non-relativistic limit of the field theory we identify in this way. And then it turns out that there are a huge class of theory which are selected out by this uh, method, which are the Toda field theory. I'm going to tell you what they are. And then we'll see that another uh, theory which enter into the game is the ON nonlinear sigma model, okay? And therefore, I'm going to conclude later that out of this, the Lieblinger is select out as the only model which come from this. Okay, diagrammar. Now, diagrammar is a famous uh, paper by Toft and Weltman when they solve uh, gauge theory, in which they say diagrams, Feynman diagrams, form the basis from which everything might be derived. So they define the operational rules and tell us when to worry about term, blah, 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 and uh, how to say, disregard some mytholog mythological object that need to be included. So what I want to say is that Toft and Weltman take the very operational and pragmatic point of view to say, field theory is what is defined by the rule. Given the rule, you can compute everything without that, okay? So I'm going to take exactly this point of view. Now, this is uh, very efficient pragmatically, but on the other hand, we have to be careful that we are excluding uh, something which might be important. For instance, sine Gordon is a theory which has a sector, which is the topological sector, which is not perturbatively, okay? So you have to be careful, I mean, but uh, once you know to use it, you are able to handle all the cases. So, 
essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to define model in terms of uh, Lagrangian in which I have the usual quadratic free part plus all possible interaction. Okay? And the rules are very simple. Propagator is just the usual uh, expression and vertices is the usual vertices. Given this, you can compute everything you want. Okay? Any amplitudes you want. So, I'm requiring the following stuff. Given this Lagrangian, which I have as a parameter, I have the masses. I'm not telling you what the masses are. Are three parameters. The coupling constant are three coupling, I mean three in the sense are not fixed. Question, are you able to find set of values of masses and coupling such that production process is zero? Okay. This means it should be some very, very non-trivial uh, relation between them. Okay, so this is the question. Now, there is uh, something, uh, first of all, uh, I forgot to mention. I'm uh, uh, discussing one plus one integrable model, one plus one field theory, because it's the only realm where you can have integrability in the usual sense. In higher dimension, it's much more complicated. So I'm in one plus one dimension. Now, it's a fact, and actually I... I propose you as an exercise that if you give me an amplitude of this type in which I have n particle with a given momentum going in n particle with a given momentum, and by the way, in uh, two dimension, there is a very, very nice trick to do all the calculation, really to instruct a computer uh, to do that because uh, you have, uh, you should respect the Lorentz. Uh, the dispersion relation in which the energy square minus momentum has to be the mass. Now this uh, you can also write down in terms of light cone, which means you define two objects like this, and then of course P plus P minus become M square. So this means I can parameterize the momenta in the way I'm doing here, really, with the two components, this and that, with a number, which if is A for this, necessarily to be A minus 1 for the other, because the result has to be M, or has to be 1. Okay? Clear? Now, this provides an amazing uh, simplification, because all these amplitudes become algebraic expression, absolutely algebraic. And so, you have to check immediately what's going on. Okay? So I parameterize all the momentum in terms of numbers, like A, B, C, D, in which the two momenta has to be A, but ne necessarily A minus one, the others. Of course, uh, I ate each vertex, I forgot to mention, you have to impose conservation of momentum. Okay? Now, it's a fact, and I, I, I propose you to check, that if I go on shell, alias all the particles satisfy this relation, this amplitude is constant. It doesn't depend at all on the momenta. It's a number. Number which, of course, depends on A, B, C, and D, and so on. Okay? So, let me show you how the things work in detail. Imagine I want to pin down what are the integrable models, which are Z2 invariants with only one field. So, I start with the most generic Z2 invariant Hamiltonian, in which I put uh, the quadratic part, the four vertex, the six vertex, the eight vertex, and so on. And then I have to pin down what are the values G4, G6, eh, which ensure this. So let me check the simplest uh, uh, process. Two particles, which goes in four particles. I have uh, definitely this vertex. You put the numbers. These are the numbers. If you just put the propagator, the two vertices, and so on and so forth, you compute it turns out to be this. It's a constant, non-zero. So if I have only four vertex, phi four, I can never kill this process. To kill it, I need uh, six vertex, a vertex of six particles, 
which if I tune properly what is the value of G6 is, I can put equal to zero. Clear? So if you give me just phi 4 and I check two particles going 4 is different from zero. So I have production. But if I'm able to add a G6 coupling and I tune properly the value of G6, I can make this amplitude zero. So if I choose G6 to be the square of G4, I kill it. On the other hand, I can go on and check all the two particles in 6, 8, 10, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to do for you here. It's very simple, though. Once I choose this, I have a recursive equation for the generic coupling of 2n particles. And there is immediately a lesson. The lesson is, if you give me a Lagrangian with a finite number of terms, the theory is never integrable. Because I can always find process in which I have production. To kill them all, I need to have infinite number of vertices. Okay? It's the first lesson that we have. Second, we are able to pin down what the coupling are. So coming back to here and substitute the value of the coupling I got, you can resum this series. <laughs> and what it is? Sinch Gordon. Okay? Now, the relation of the coupling is quadratic. So I can have also sine Gordon. Not only sinch, but also sine. The two different by the fact that you have an I. However, I'm excluding from the, my presentation the sin, the sine Gordon for the reason I say that it's not fair to make a how to say a manifesto with the diagram R and then using sine Gordon, which there are hidden sectors. But there are, and the equations show as well. Okay? So Sinch Gordon is the only Z2 integrable model in town with one field. Okay? Now you can repeat the story. Imagine that you say, okay, I want to give up the Z2 symmetry. I want to put the most uh, generic uh, Lagrangian with one field in which I have even and odd things. So you can, uh, for instance, explore what are now two going to four. There are more vertices, of course. And then you can find a recursive equation for all these vertices, imposing that they kill arbitrary large order of production. You have a recursive equation for the couplings, and you want to impose with zero this amplitude, therefore you find what are the solution. So my dull computer can find the solution for these equations. And once I go back and uh, substitute the values, it turns out a very well-known model, which is the bull of dot model. It's the only integrable model in town, which is not Z2 uh, even, with one field. Clear? The strategy is clear. So the strategy is, if I go in field theory, a priori I have much, much, much more choices. But at the same time, I'm much, much more constrained. Here, I can put as a criteria integrability, no production, no diffraction scattering. The reason is, if I have integrability, I have infinite number of current. Infinite number of current imply elasticity. Elasticity means no production. And so I'm exploring this criteria in the, in the back. I'm trying to find all the couplings such that will not be production. Okay? In this way, you pin down from the infinite realm of field theory, in this case, just two. Okay? Now, this, is, uh, this integrable sieve, of course, is uh, three level. Three level, as you probably know, is classical field theory. Okay? So it's like classifying equation of motion. Okay, so the point is uh, if I identify the classical level and I'm quantum, I should check that it's stable at the quantum level. Okay? So when I go to the quantum level, I have uh, two effects that I have to care about infinite and finite renormalization group. Because, you know, field theory suffers by renormalization process. 
Okay, now, I want to draw the attention that the problem I've been solving is exponentially hard. Means that given a certain number of external length, the number of, of a diagram that you have to control and check that is zero grows exponentially. Okay? So, and moreover, for this, this is some uh, diagram relative to two going to five. Moreover, if you go in certain, uh, in certain sector, as uh, we'll see, because you have to check two goings in everything is zero, but also three goings in everything is zero, four goings in everything is zero. And uh, for instance, part of this diagram, if you turn the line, the numbers are completely different. Completely different. It's not something that you have done and then you have done for the other. Rearrange completely. So, in conclusion, classification of uh, integrable field theory at the classical level pass through solving infinite number of equations, each one involves an exponential number of terms. Solving equation might be very difficult, but verifying that certain set of masses and coupling satisfy is simple. Now, in computer science, this is called NP-complete problem. So, to find solution on the first side of exponential can be horrible, but once I give you a solution to check that it works, is relatively simple, okay? Now, NP problem, as I say, there's this peculiarity. So, at this point, I want to, br to bring uh, into the game uh, total field theory, and probably I will uh, discuss in detail uh, tomorrow. So, because uh, this theory provides for you the solution of this equation, okay? So, you can check easily that they are solution of the equation. So from this point of view, it's like I give you the solution of NP-complete problem. So this uh, theory has been studied by many people in, uh, in the past. And what they are, as I say, these are non-trivial solutions of this, and probably this is uh, something uh, I work on uh, in the past. It's probably the only one I can give you a reason for that. So I, I have to tell you what uh, these uh, theories are. So these theories are constructed in the following way. You give me R fields, R bosonic fields. R can be only one, like sine Gordon. You take uh, a Lie algebra of rank R. And this Lie algebra, as you know, has some simple roots, which are R roots and are R vectors. Now, and I want to make here a course of group theory, of course, but Lie algebra are essentially a bunch of vectors, linear vectors of R dimension, which has the property that any of these vectors is invariant under reflection of the plane given by all the others. So if you give me some vectors, this vector identify a plane. If you give me another vector, I can find the reflection of this plane. So this bunch of roots as the marvelous property to be invariant under all possible reflection. It's the most uh, symmetric object you can imagine of. It's how you construct uh, Lie groups. So this uh, total field theory, the building block is R fields, in which they use the R plus one, because there is an extra root, in which you make the scalar product with this, and then you make the exponential. So cinch Gordon is when you have SU2, when you have only one root, and therefore it's one root, and the other root is minus, the sum of exponential alpha and minus is the sinus, or the cosinus, okay? So you can uh, find all the property of this on uh, group theory, and then all, uh, all the relative data of that. Now, for these theories, all buses and coupling come in a very discrete set that are essentially all expressed by the roots. So, which is the key point why this theory fulfill at once an infinite number of identity. Say differently. If I give you a bunch of vectors, the fact that they are invariant under reflection, the probability is zero. Okay? Because the, these vectors are very well tuned to do exactly this job. 
But once they do it, everything is constrained. You cannot move anything, okay? And therefore, they satisfy infinite number of identities by default. For instance, the mass of this theory is very, very simple. You give me a diagram, Dinkin diagram, and you have just to do a random walk on this Dinkin diagram, finding the asymptotic probability of these things. The asymptotic probability give you the masses, which because are positive values. For instance, if you give me the diagram of E7, you have seven masses with very, very specific value, which are algebraic numbers. You see, very, very specific. Everything is fixed, rigorously fixed. So the lowest mass is one, but the next lowest is twice cosine five pi over 18. No other value, this one. If you give me E8, these are the masses. There is the golden ratio is the lowest excitation, and then there are eight other masses. And the rule is the lowest mass is uh, essentially the node which is far off in this diagram. Two is the farthest next one, and then you can pin down where they go exactly with this random motion on this diagram, okay? Okay, so you can write down all, uh, all uh, the masses for that. In particular, you can also write down what are the three particle vertices. Given two particles, what are the... Because this is uh, given by a sum on the roots, and there's a very, very geometrical uh, interpretation of this coupling, is essentially non-zero if the masses uh, are side of a triangle. If the masses are not side of a triangle, it's zero. So, at this point, uh, let me just give you the last uh, things and then I stop here. So, imagine I have uh, these theories, a certain idea why they solve this. You can take it, diagram matrix, check, and they satisfy all the equation of uh, no production. Non-trivial masses, non-trivial equation, but they are so tuned that they satisfy it at all. So, they provide a solution to this equation. Are the only solution? This is the question. Years ago, I did a completely different job. I start from axiomatic S matrix point of view. S matrix is when you start from an object which gives you all the amplitude of scattering. And there is a very well-known procedure to identify what are the functions of the scattering uh, uh, problem. And moreover, to set up a recursive equation which provide you the S matrix also the bound state. So I have no time to explain, but means that if you give me a seed to start with, I can give for you all the relative amplitude as far they are consistent. So this means that from a computer science point of view, given a seed, you immediately start a ramification, a tree, because this produces more, 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 more amplitude and the pole of this amplitude identify the bound state. So the rule of the game is, can you find what are the pole of this object which are close under this dancing? And only very, very few uh, value do this game, alias, do the game that after a certain iteration in this uh, tree, the system stop. Otherwise, you have infinite number of... So, I just want to say that uh, this theory, yeah, I, I, no, but I finished, don't worry. Okay, so just uh, let me make this point and then I will stop here. So, there is a series of arguments why 
theory construct on root of Lie algebra are the only model in town for integrability. The first is you just go and check they satisfy this infinite number of equations, and they do. The other is, as I said, I did a completely different approach. I start axiomatically classifying as matrices. There is a way of doing, and requiring a closure of the S matrix, when I see my basket, the only thing that remained by basket was the S matrix of total field theory, nothing else. Okay? So, this uh, select these things, and on top of that, these theory are absolutely stable under renormalization. Because when you have a vertex uh, operator like this, you know that vertex operator renormalize multiplicatively. So this means that all the bunch of uh, exponential interaction renormalize in the same way. So I have not to tune any coupling uh, at one. I just re re renormalize one mass. But this is arbitrary. Moreover, under finite uh, renormalization, this diagram in 1 plus 1 is finite, is a number. They go exactly the same way. Go exactly the same way. So, summarizing, the total field theory is the most general setting in which you find integrability in, uh, no rela in the relativistic field theory. They satisfy the bootstrap, satisfy everything, are non-trivial set of masses and non-trivial set of coupling. So, next time, I will start from this to see what's going on of them when I take the normal relativistic limit. Clear? Okay, I stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Giuseppe, for the fascinating lecture. Question, Sandy. I have a question about, you said in non-relativity,